Yes, Miss Kelly. Good morning, my lord, my lady. I know you've had a bit of trouble getting into the building this morning. Yes, we have. Um, so apologies for uh, any delay. Um, my lord, I appear on behalf yes. of the appellant, as I did so in the lower court. Could I just say a couple of things before we start? Uh, first of all, this appeal is being live-streamed. Uh, so for that reason, and indeed other reasons, I think it would be a good idea not to mention the names of anybody in this case, including the local authority. Uh, you, you can name the judge, but not the local authority or the adult members. So we're going to have to agree how we're going to refer to people, because there are two mothers, and the word mother is used interchangeably, I think, in the judgment a few times. It, it is. And so I suggest we call your client the appellant. Indeed. And uh, the mother of the subject child, uh, uh, the mother, and uh, the father. Does that make sense for everybody? Um, secondly, um, have you had a chance to discuss how you're going to divide your time? No, um, my lord, we have not had that opportunity. We've had very brief um, discussions I in terms of, of what is still opposed. Um, and in terms of the uh, additional application, that is the application yes. to amend the grounds, um, in light of the email, and hopefully, my lord, the court has received that email from yes. the Communion Court. It is not a full report. Um, I accept that. That is not available. And it's not far. It's not doesn't hasn't been filed in accordance with the rules. But put that to one side for the moment. I, I'm grateful for that. Um, I understand, in light of that, that the local authority um, no longer oppose the application to amend the grounds of appeal, um, although still oppose the appeal um, I in itself. Right. Um, I, I understand um, from my learned friend or the mother that the application to amend the grounds is still um, opposed uh, by the mother. Okay, right. So go back to the division of time, just so we get the day sorted out. How long do you envisage you, you will take? Um, my Lord, I anticipate that I will be somewhere in the region of 90 minutes. Right. Well, that sounds about right. And then you, Miss uh, Stone, will be the rest of the morning. And um, possibly going into the afternoon, I don't know. Maybe not. And Miss Barry, your case substantially follows the local authorities. Yes. So it sounds uh, there will be time for a reply from Miss Kelly. Um, so it sounds they were going to be finished in good time by 4.15. Well, the only um, issue I would raise in respect of that is that we do now have um, an intermediary report that uh, says that um, the appellant requires the assistance of the yes. intermediary. We've also had um, a cognitive assessment and a, a psychological assessment that make further recommendations in, in terms of, of um, how the appellant um, uh, listens to, obtains uh, and um, assimilates information. And therefore, I would seek that there are regular breaks um, for Miss Davis. Generally. How long, how often would you like the breaks? Um, I, I would suggest in accordance with the Advocates Gateway that there is a break um, of a few minutes, uh, approximately every 45 um, to 60 minutes. Okay. Well, let's see how we go. And I'll keep an eye, uh, obviously, if, if we keep an, an eye on the clock and uh, at a convenient point, either you will remember or I will remember and we'll take a break. Are you content to deal with it on that basis? I, I am, yes, okay. um, my Lord, although I, 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 I may forget um, in the moment as it were. So may I. Ho hopefully will be reminded. Um, my assistant behind um, may remind me. Is your client in court? My client does sit behind me yes. um, and she is assisted today by uh, a, a paralegal from my instructing solicitors. Right and is the mother in court? Um, my lord no um, she's not okay. um, albeit she may well be uh, watching. On live stream. On the Thank you. Media. Okay, so far as the amendment is con the uh, application to amend the grounds, I think what we'd like to do is to to um, we've read the document uh, De Bene essay, and, and so we'd like to consider the substance of the ground, and we'll make a decision about whether or not we um, allow the amendment in our in our ultimate judgment. So you can argue the point, uh, the substantive point. Um, now, uh, I, I don't, when you take your pick as to when you want to argue it. Uh, indeed, my lord. Okay. I, I was going to suggest that course of action as my submissions in respect of, of um, an application for permission to amend are going to be the same 
as my um, application yes. in the appeal. Well, now we've read, we've read. I think that all the documents that you uh, collectively asked us to read, we've dipped in. Some of us have dipped into the transcripts of the evidence as well. So you can take it that we're pretty familiar with the facts and the background and the issues. I'm grateful, um, and on that basis, Lord, I, I won't therefore uh, give you a, a background summary. May I just um, check, because I am aware that the bundles have been filed with the court on, on differing days due to yes. the documents and becoming available, um, that the court has the benefit of, of the core bundle, which yes. is an agreed bundle, yes. a supplemental bundle, yes. um, and then there is, an there is a further supplemental bundle, yes. um, a and in that bundle there is two chronologies, um, one which outlines um, the uh, injuries uh, and marks that have been found on Jay um, whilst at school, both before and after the relevant time period, um, and another chronology which sets out what each of the parties says happened um, on that relevant uh, time period from the 18th to the 20th of January, and that information is contained, as I understand, in the additional um, supplemental bundle that was filed late to enable it to have um, all of the paginations once the bundles were agreed to assist the court. Did you have a direction allowing you to file additional mm. bundles? No, um, my lord, we, we did not. We had a direction, um, and it is uh, identified in that chronology, that when the application for uh, to, to amend the um, grounds of appeal, um, the direction there was to file all the, the documents that were relied right. upon. And that was a broad direction. Okay. Uh, and my All right. Well, instructing solicitor has made use of it. Let's get on then. I'm grateful. Thank you, my lord. Um, uh, as I indicated earlier, I, I appear on behalf of the appellant, as I did in the lower court. Leading counsel, um, Miss Stone, appears on behalf of the local authority, as she did in, in the in the lower um, court. Um, the mother today is represented by Miss Barry. Um, who I understand has previously rep represented the mother on a couple of occasions, but was not not, the not counsel um, at the fact-finding hearing. Um, my Lord, just before I start, um, I, I just want to check that you've also had the documents that were filed um, by on behalf of the mother. They came in very late yesterday yes. morning at um, half past nine. Yes. Um, there was within those documents um, a note, uh, an explanatory note, as to the delay. Um, I, I raise that only that um, I, I note in the email correspondence between the court um, and instructing solicitors, there was an indication that the court might require to hear from the mother's advocate. Yeah, well, we've got. I asked for, the, for a written explanation of the reasons for the late filing. I've seen that, and um, I don't. I, 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 if I have any more to say about that, or if we do, we'll ask Ms. Barry about that when we get to her. I, I'm grateful. In that case, uh, my lord, I, I will go straight. Um, to uh, my application to am amend the grounds, um, reintroducing what, what I say is ground one, that it is a procedural um, irregularity and unfairness um, in respect of, of the mother, um, in respect of the appellant, in that um, the appellant had uh, unknown cognitive um, difficulties. Um, and on that basis, given that there were no ground rules herein, there was no um, provision or of any um, uh, any intervention um, for the um, uh, appellant, um, that the hearing was not in that basis fair to her. Um, and the reason that I, I say that is that the, the, the judge, um, her honour judge Nisa, um, from the evidence that the um, appellant gave, um, formed a, a view um, of the uh, appellant, um, and that was a very negative view. Um, and I say that it um, that that view arose out of the way and the manner um, in which the appellant gave her answer, her evidence, and the manner in which she um, answered um, those questions. Um, uh, I say in, re in relation um, to the law that is outlined in my uh, skeleton argument, and it's at a 38 to 43 for the benefit of the court. I do rely on that um, that law. Uh, I don't intend to repeat it unless the court wishes me to do so. Um, however, to say 
um, simply that uh, in respect of all of the grounds, the appellant is perfectly aware, and I accept um, that Her Honour Judge Nisa had a very wide uh, uh, discretion uh, and that there are um, Court of Appeal decisions where the, the, um, any applicant um, is referenced as having somewhat of an uphill task. Uh, and, my Lord, I, I do take that on, on board. Um, I, I will address the Court in respect of the uh, permission in that it is still opposed by um, the, the, the mother. Um, and what I say in respect of that, and it's outlined um, in the Skellington argument, that as a trial advocate, um, some concerns um, were, were, were well, not raised by me, but I had some concerns in respect of the mother's evidence as it progressed. I, I would go no further to say that it was um, a concern. It was more of a niggly um, unease as opposed to a firm view that there was um, a cognitive um, issue. And certainly I would say there wasn't enough at that point to raise red flags that would require me to ask for the proceedings to be stopped um, and for uh, a cognitive assessment um, to, be, uh, to, to be undertaken. It wasn't clear to me, um, and even on reflection of the um, transcript of the intervener's evidence, I, I'm still not um, uh, entirely convinced it comes across um, whether mother had cognitive difficulties, difficulty understanding the questions, um, and whether that was down to um, giving evidence in a stressful situation. Uh, and my Lord, you will note um, from the transcript of the intervener's evidence that in particular with her evidence, there were significant issues with the technology, with being able to hear um, questions. Um, Miss Stone for the local authority um, endeavoured to ensure that the intervener could hear all questions that were put to her. Um, but there was definite difficulty um, with technology uh, in respect of the questioning. So just help me with the how, how it worked. Where was, every, where was everybody located? Um, we were all remote. Um, the intervener um, was attended remotely from the my instructing solicitor's office, but she was alone um, in the room. So she didn't have the assistance um, of um, a paralegal or, or a solicitor. So she was alone? She was alone in my solicitor's office. Where was your solicitor? Not there? No, in another room. She wasn't in the building on her own, but she was certainly in the room when she gave evidence um, on her own. Uh, and my Lord, that is evident from the transcript. Yeah. Because there are, and where were you? Um, I, I was at home. And where was Miss, Miss Stone was at another location? Yes, we, we, Miss Stone uh, was at another location. And the judge was at another location? The judge was at another location. I cannot recall off the top of my head if the judge was um, at home on that occasion or oh, sitting yeah. in court. Um, but certainly the advocates for the parents, uh, as my understanding is, were, were at home uh, and had some difficulty um, with technology. Uh, and my Lord, you will see from the transcript, I, I don't need to refer you to it, 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 it is there, that um, Miss um, Knight, who, who sits behind me uh, today, was required to go in um, and assist um, the intervener to re-establish her connection on, on a couple of occasions. So I say it, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't a clear-cut case that there was cognitive difficulties during the course um, of the intervener's evidence. And, of course, in, in these proceedings, um, she was an intervener, uh, so there wasn't um, regular um, input with her in terms of assessments, in terms of talking to the social worker. And you will have seen from the judgment, um, my Lord, that the relevant social worker in, in the matter of this case had not met or even spoken to um, Miss Davis, um, and so her instructions um, were in response, in respect of what she said happened, and responding to the evidence um, of, of the other. Parties. So, the, so the local authority at that stage weren't involved with with your client. My understanding is that there was um, child <coughs> child in need, child protection, um, as a result of the section forty seven inquiries, um, but uh, it is right that no proceedings were brought yeah, at that but, time. but Jay had been um, identified as a child in need. Is that right? 
result, it, it came after. Following the section 47. It, it came, yes, the section 47 in respect of the injuries came first. Yeah, but at the time of the hearing, your client had a social worker involved in her life. Yes, <coughs> that is right, sir. While I'm on this, something I just wanted to ask you before we started, forgive me. What's the current position about Jay? Are there proceedings ongoing? Yes, my lord, there are proceedings. And where is Jay ongoing. at the moment? I'm at home with his mother. Under any, any, any order? Uh, Interim order? It, care or supervision? I believe a mistake and correct me if I'm wrong. Supervision, Under order. supervision order. When are those proceedings coming to the final hearing? There is, um, I understand, uh, an IRH in December. Um, uh, my instructions, and of course I, I haven't been involved in, in that case um, for some time. Um, the last hearing was a little while ago. Um, but on my instructions, uh, and Miss Stone will correct me if, if I am wrong, and obviously I won't go into too much detail because, of course, the, the mother and father in these proceedings are not party to those. Yeah. Um, that it, it appears to be going well, um, and on my instructions, um, may well conclude. Uh, that, that is the only information that I have. Uh, Miss Stone, I can see looking um, towards you, my lord. But, uh, we have I was wondering if Miss Stone could confirm that in simple terms, one way or the other. I can't. I can't, I can't confirm it, my Lord. All I know is the IRH is the 20th of December. Parenting assessment due to be filed at the end of November, 29th of November. I can't comment on the... Uh, and you won't be able to comment um, by getting further instructions at this stage? I, I could get some further instructions. Yes, well, it will be, help, it will be helpful for this Court to know, um, if, if possible, what the likely outcome of those proceedings is, if you can tell us. Thank Are you. Are they also in Guildford County Court? As far as I'm aware, and yes. Is, is Judge Nisa seized of those as well? Can I just have a moment? Yeah, I, I may be able to assist there, my lady. Yes, Judge Nisa is seized of those um, uh, proceedings. An application um, was made at the outset um, for rec recusal, but uh, on the basis that the findings hadn't at that point been appealed and they stood, um, that was refused. So yes, Judge Nisa, Your Honour Judge Nisa is still seized of those proceedings. Yes. Sorry, I interrupted you. You were, talk, talk, you were putting forward your arguments on uh, the amended ground one. Yes, I, I'm grateful. Thank you, my lord. Um, so further concerns. The intervener um, had no further part in these proceedings once the fact-finding hearing came to an end, um, and she was discharged from those proceedings. There, therefore, it wasn't possible at that point to identify that there may be a need for further assessment of the mother's cognitive abilities or indeed a psychological assessment at that time. Proceedings in respect of Jay were not brought until um, much, much later um, than March uh, the 1st when judgment um, was handed down. And it was only in the course of um, those proceedings and exploring with the intervener the evidence um, and the findings <laughs> that it, it, it became more apparent um, that there may be um, a cognitive issue and an issue um, with understanding. Uh, and therefore, the intervener underwent a cognitive assessment um, by Dr. Taylor. Yeah. Part of the application today uh, is for permission to um, adduce that evidence yeah. together with the psychological report of Dr. Joslyn. It, it is um, uh, provided on a heavily redacted um, uh, form in that there are only two paragraphs that, <laughs> that are that are unredacted, one in each one. Mm -hmm. um, the paragraph in respect of Dr. Taylor's report um, suggests that um, the mother may have some um, low-level cognitive functioning, but there are no special measures um, that, that have been recommended. Ms. Stone very helpfully um, pointed out uh, to me outside of court this morning that... Um, she wasn't aware that the um, cognitive assessment um, was to be redacted. She is, of, of course, uh, I understand, involved in the, in the other proceedings, um, so had access to that. Uh, and one of the questions that um, Dr. Taylor was asked um, was whether or not the, the, the mother required an intermediary. I cannot see that that has been specifically answered, save to say that she doesn't need a, his view um, any, any particular um, uh, intervention, but there may be ways in which she could be assisted. Um, that led on to um, the intervener having a psychological assessment by Dr. Josling, and that report came, came in um, again much later 
um, and it's in that report that there is one paragraph, my lord, that, uh, my lady, that you may have seen, um, where she suggests that an intermediary may be um, necessary. And it was on seeing that report that it was considered to be uh, prudent um, and in fairness to, to all parties and mindful of court time to alert the court and parties that, to the fact that uh, a, a, an intermediary assessment was going to take place and that took place, um, as I understand it, on the 17th of November, so only last week, and that in the event that that indicated that the, the intervener required the assistance of an intermediary, then um, permission would be sought to uh, amend the grounds of appeal and accordingly my instructing solicitor made that application um, in any event. Um, yes. Uh, and my lord, it was initially opposed by the local authority on the basis that it was um, only a may need um, uh, uh, an intermediary. Um, uh, and um, there was some suggestion that um, that information uh, with, with a sort of diligent uh, um, forethought and could have brought it to the attention um, of the judge and a cognitive assessment could have been undertaken um, during those previous these proceedings during the fact finding hearing, um, and my submission for, for the reasons that I, I've given above of the, is that that would not um, have been um, uh, something that we were able to do at that time, and that this information was not available um, at the fact finding hearing and couldn't um, reasonably have been made available. Um, at and we the now have a letter from Community Court. And we do, my lord. We have a letter. I, uh, as I said uh, at the outset, I accept that it's not a report and it, it doesn't set out um, any full recommendations. That report won't be um, available for a week. Um, Community Court were asked to provide um, a very brief bullet point um, summary, which they have done to assist the court um, today, um, and that has been circulated uh, to the parties. Um, and it's on that basis <laughs> that I say that um, the intervener, uh, the appellant uh, rather, is entitled to um, be considered as a vulnerable witness uh, and accordingly um, she should have been afforded um, the, uh, the, the um, ability to have had provisions put in place for a vulnerable witness, which would have um, included um, consideration of how um, questions were put to the appellant, how um, they were formulated, um, and consideration to her responses um, would have been uh, able to have been uh, taken. Um, and, and it's that that I say is really relevant for the purposes of this uh, appeal. In terms of um, the assessments by um, Dr. Taylor uh, and um, Dr. Joslyn, Ms. Stone rightly um, points out to me to say that she has seen the unredacted versions uh, and they do not um, make reference to um, the appellant um, having um, said that she didn't understand the fact-finding hearing. And of course, um, I have to accept that. That is, they're not in those reports. However, those were not specific um, to court proceedings. And of course, we now are awaiting an intermediary report um, which will be far more focused towards the court proceedings and her participation. Um, and it is unknown at this time whether there are any comments made in terms of understanding of the fact finding and the fairness um, to her in that report. So there's going to be a fact, is there going to be a, a ground rules hearing in the proceedings ongoing regarding Jay? Or does that depend on what happens at the IRH? Um, I anticipate that at the IRH um, an application will be made um, for um, a ground rules hearing. I, I, I don't anticipate that it's going to be sought that there's a separate um, hearing. There, there are fairly standard um, recommendations uh, and interventions that are taken in accordance with the advocate's gateway. And if there are any further recommendations made by Communicourt, then they can be incorporated um, into that, but it will, of course, put the court on, on notice that um, the uh, appellant has those cognitive difficulties and those difficulties with assimilating um, both written uh, and verbal information. So, in in terms of um, the judge's view um, of the uh, appellant, um, which I say arises out of um, the appellant's evidence. 
what the judge says at paragraph um, uh, 33, and it's at A29 of the bundle, what, the, what um, Her Honour Judge Nisa says there is, the intervener has lied, and it is not in my view that she is embarrassed. She has far more to hide and a lot to lose in that regard. Even in her evidence... So which paragraph are you reading from now? Uh, paragraph 33 of A29. Yes. Um, this is on the drug-taking issue. Yes. But, but, but I, I'm referring to it on this occasion it, as, as a generalisation of the judge's approach to the appellant's evidence. Um, and she says that she, um, at a, a 30 then, uh, my lord, the judge recounts her, dis her dissatisfaction with her mother's, um, I'm sorry, my lord, I, I've lost my, my moment. So yes, I'm back at paragraph 33 of 829 where the intervener is said to have lied and that is in the judge's view not because she's embarrassed but because she has far more to hide and a lot to lose in that regard. And the judge says even in her evidence she did not seem to give it the seriousness that she ought to have done. And I say that is a reflection of the intervener's understanding um, of the proceedings uh, and is evidenced by her other judge Nisa there. The judge goes on to say she was still in partial denial, but by her attitude, she was trying to state that it was something wrong with the results. The testing was not right, and the result would have been different if she had not used hair dye, etc. And then she says, I was not impressed by the intervener's evidence. Of course, we know that the judge um, has amended um, her findings in respect of part of the um, intervener appellant's uh, drug use, um, where she says she accepts um, that the, the, the um, quantity of the hair strand test was not something that, that the intervener had um, tampered with. There was only um, seven <coughs> months that could be tested, nine months were provided, so the full nine months were given, um, and the judge accepted that. Um, in, in terms of the injury to the face, the slap mark, uh, uh, as it um, was been referred to by all. At paragraph 36 to 37 of her judgment at A30, the judge recounts her dissatisfaction with the mother's account of what she did when she found those injuries. I I'm not going to go through those specifically, um, but at paragraph 38, um, the judge records that the appellant's evidence generally, I would say she was very deflective, unable to answer the questions in a way that lost the actual question. I would say that her answers were calculating, and I think she certainly started the campaign to point the finger at this mother in these proceedings to deflect away from herself. Uh, and what I say, my Lord, is that's a clear indication of the view that the judge took as a direct result of the evidence and the way it was given um, by the appellant. Uh, and what I say that now the appellant's evidence must be looked at in light of the intermediary um, recommendations, small as they are, and potentially in light of the assessment um, that, that is forthcoming. Uh, and I say that the question that the, the court needs to consider is would the judge have formed that same view and reached those conclusions had she had the benefit um, of an intermediary report. Had she well, you've gone, you've gone to 38. Uh, are you going back to 36 and 37? Uh, a, a 30, yes. A paragraph 38, yes. Yes. 30, uh, 36, if we trace it through at 37, she goes through the mother's, sorry, the appellant's yes. account of what happened to Jay that morning. Yes, she does. And... She's asked the question <clears throat> why she didn't text the mother saying, can you tell me what happened to the face? Yes. Uh, uh, so that is a, the fact that she didn't ask that question, didn't text the mother, is a point that she takes against your client. Yes. Judge. And then she bumps into the friend and asks the friend... Yes, and it, it would appear, my lord, from the judgment that the, the judge doesn't entirely accept that there may have been a friend even present.
present. Uh, I'm not, not certain how the judge... Your client's account one. was, the friend had said, it looks like a slap, you better inform social services. That was, that was what your client said the yes, friend had said. Indeed. And the judge then relies, it seems to me, for my part, quite heavily on the, the delay of 40 minutes. From school, I indeed. Um, before she did that. I'm taking this quite shortly. If the mother was so concerned with somebody else, she would have informed the school immediately. Mother there, in both cases, that's the appellant, isn't it, of course? I would say her actions are surprising. She didn't seek some guidance from the school, went home and thought about it. Is it part of your case? And does nothing about it for what she calls a considerable period of time. Is it part of your case that in evaluating your client's behaviour that morning, it is, isn't it? this is your case really, in evaluating your client's behaviour that morning, uh, the judge did not take into account what we now know exactly. about your client's difficulties because she didn't have that information available. I indeed. And do you say that taints the judge's findings on this issue? Uh, well, in order, uh, as I was, going, I was go, going to go on to say that um, uh, based o on that, um, had she known that information, had that been available, had there been um, some measures put in place that would have assisted the appellant to give her best evidence, um, that it would be likely that the judge would not have reached um, those conclusions. Well, there are two points right now. First of all, there's a question of giving the evidence, the quality of the, the way in which they should, the assessment of the evidence, but also what your client did that morning. Is that also part of your case? It is. Um, I, I was going to address you in, in more detail in respect okay. of that. In your own time. It, 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 when, we submissions when, when, when we get there. I, I'm happy to, but it is relevant. to do that now. It, it seems to me it's relevant. It, it, it is relevant. If your client has some learning difficulties of whatever sort, it, it is. borderline, then it's, inter it's relevant to the interpretation of her behaviour that morning. It, it is indeed very relevant to the interpretation of, of her um, behaviour. Um, and what she considers to be um, the correct course of action. Um, and the mother has been quite consistent, um, I would say, in the accounts that she has given uh, uh, firstly, uh, and off the top of my head, because I'm not quite there yet on my paperwork, I believe it's at A2, um, she says that she was shocked and she didn't know what to do. She gives her first account that she um, saw a friend, at uh, another parent at the school, and asked her what she thought of the marks on Jay's face. Um, that was repeated in her um, statements. It was also repeated in her oral evidence. Um, and what I say in respect of that, given the um, appellant's um, difficulties, uh, certainly what is said by the intermediary in respect of her difficulty with memory, it would be unlikely that this in intervener, this uh, appellant, would have been able to have remembered exactly what she said on each occasion. Um, to each person, and she's been consistent in that element um, well, of her account. Perhaps you can't go that far, but you can say it's open to question, can you? What, to what, in considering whether she would have remembered, yes. what the court would take into account what they know about her. I, of course, my lord, I'm stretching um, the point as far as I can in, in, <laughs> in the appellant's favour, but yes, I, I would accept that that is something I would say that, that is open to the court um, to have found. Um, Ms Kelly, can I just, um, my reading of paragraphs 37 and 38 are that the judge really based her conclusion on three facts, and let's just get them out there. One was the 40 minute delay, yes. and, that letting, and, and um, two was who was notified, not the school, but the local the social services, I think, were um, notified. And three, we haven't touched on yet, but it's the point that comes out of 38, the inherent unlikelihood yeah. Um, of um, all these injuries having been inflicted by someone else whose own child hadn't got any bruises or injuries of note or concern. So it seemed to me that it was the conflation of those three things together, and they're objective facts, you might say, that the judge is mm. entitled to take account of. 
that led into her, her adverse conclusion to your client? Yes, I, I, I would accept that, um, that the beginning of paragraph 38 certainly um, feeds into um, the judge's uh, conclusion, but I would say that without um, points one and two, um, even in light of point three, um, had she known, had, had anybody known about the cognitive difficulties and the, indeed the memory issues, um, then that um, she, she would still, I say, uh, likely not have reached those same conclusions, or I would say she shouldn't have reached um, the conclusions that, that she did. Or she might not have done. Yes. Can you go further than that? She might have done, but she not having this. This was a, your, your case. Is this was a crucial part of the jigsaw yes. piece of information interpreting that your client's evidence. Yes, uh, uh, and uh, my lord, I I say that um, the jigsaw wasn't complete, um, uh, as it were. That the judge had only um, parts, um, uh, and uh, in my final submissions, when I hope to draw it all together, I will be saying that the, that. Um, Her Honour Judge Nisa hadn't looked properly at the broad canvas um, when she was reaching her conclusions and that she focused um, uh, uh, in my submission, um, particularly in respect of the appellant, um, in terms of um, the lies in respect of the, the ketamine um, use in, in February. There is, um, I say, my Lord, quite heavy, heavy, heavy um, reliance placed on that and whilst it's right that in her judgment, Her Honour Judge Nisa does remind herself um, of the Lucas direction, uh, and I would say in, in my submission, applies that liberally to the mother's evidence in this case. It certainly, it, on my reading um, of Her Honour's judgment, um, appear that uh, Her Honour has applied that Lucas di direction correctly um, to the intervener. Um, she seems to have uh, founded that having lied about the ketamine use uh, is my submission that, that the judge has placed too much reliance on that um, and has found that she's lied um, about other things which I say um, the evidence uh, doesn't support but I, I, will, I, I will address we'll come on in more that. detail uh, yes. in respect to, of, of those um, it, it is um, said by uh, Miss Stone on behalf of the local authority in her skeleton argument um, that the mother was able to answer questions and, and I, I, I don't um, shy away from that, I accept that, the mother did answer um, questions um, the, the, sorry, the appellant did ask, answer questions um, and yes she was able to say that um, I'm slow at reading uh, and that I have um, dyslexia uh, and Miss Stone uh, goes on to say that I intervened on occasions uh, on, on reflection of the um, transcript of the appellant's evidence on, on more than two or three occasions um, asking for the intervener to be referred to documents because it seemed to me that there was some confusion um, at that time. Um, and what I say in respect of that, um, it, it, and I know that the local authority don't oppose the, amend, the, the application to amend, um, but I'm going to respond to that because it, it is supported by the mother who does is that intervention by counsel to guide to um, a paragraph, to seek um, that guidance to a paragraph is provided, is not a satisfactory substitute for um, proper consideration, evaluation and measures um, for a vulnerable client given their evidence. And I say that it doesn't um, negate away from the fact that um, the appellant uh, required uh, an, an intermediary. In terms of evidencing issues um, with the um, mother, uh, with the appellant's participation, uh, and I, I don't want to labour these points, um, but at C203, when answering questions from the local authority, right. as already said, let's just, let's just get it. C203. Yes. When answering questions um, from the local authority. Uh, as I have already um, alluded to in my earlier submission, <coughs> um, that the appellant says that um, she is a slow reader, and that's a quarter of a page, quarter way down the page. Yes, sorry, I'm a bit slow um, at reading. Um, and then um, the 
the appellant is asked to read an account from police and she's asked if she um, recalls what um, she said. Um, and bear with me, my lord, I appear to have lost my reference for that. Yes, it's a little bit further down. Um, she's been asked if she um, recalls what's been said um, in, in the report uh, and what um, the appellant responds to. Uh, and the particular paragraph she was being referred to is her initial account of the injuries and, and how she, she saw them. But what the appellant um, responds to is, there's actually been along the way a few things twisted and I say it was social services. And then she's asked, what do you say was twisted? And she says, as in, I said all the way through, I knew where Josh was. Uh, Ch Jay. Um, I, yes, thank you, uh, my lord. I knew where Jay was. I knew what flat he was in. I just couldn't remember what number, the door. And I said that all the way through. And in this, they've just keep writing down, she didn't know where her son was. Um, uh, and it's clear that the question um, from Miss Stone um, was in respect of, of the injuries, um, and yet the, the uh, appellant had missed that um, in the question, um, and that may be um, part of the judge's reasoning that she was deflective or answering questions um, without answering the question. Um, and, and I say that that is a, a, a relevant um, issue. At, at C204, and I'm not going to go through all of them, it's, it's just a handful that I have, have picked out. Um, at C204, the appellant is asked how long, in, in the middle of the page for the court's benefit, how long had she been friends with the mother in the proceedings? Um, and the appellant struggles to know um, and tries to date that by when um, her elder son started a particular school. Um, but the mother struggles with the date of that um, a, as well. At C207, um, the appellant is asked if she knows what an abrasion is. Um, and she replies, um, is that a bruise? Um, in answers to questions on behalf of the mother, uh, and it may be helpful to look at it at um, C248, Um, it, it, uh, in respect of Mark that has been seen to, um, to Jay. Um, and it's a third of the way down. Um, for context, I, 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 I will read um, the preceding um, sentences. It says that uh, in C40, in your statement to the court, you said you did not see any marks to the face. The answer is, I didn't, apart from the red face. But you see, it's different to what you said to the doctor. And the answer is, well, so the doctor was on a Tuesday and Jay got dropped back to me on a Sunday. The question is right, and then we've got a different version when you do your statement to the court in September of last year. And then the answer is, a question, where? And it's, it's what you're looking at, at C40. And the answer is, what do you mean, I've got a different statement? I said a different version. Okay, let me look at it slightly differently. Uh, and again, I say that that's indicative of, of the mother having difficulty um, following um, the proceedings and following um, the questioning, particularly on reflection um, with the transcript. Well, it goes on. Um, top of 249. This is the mother's advocate, is it? It is, yes, my lord. She says, we'll come back to that tomorrow. Yes. And uh, your client says, you're trying to confuse me and it's not working. It, that, that's right. Um, yes, my lord. Uh, and uh, the, the response is, I'm not trying to, to confuse you. But clearly, clearly the appellant felt, um, so I, I would sell my submission, some degree of discomfort at that point, at, at the way the questions were coming at, towards her. Uh, and is demonstrating a, a lack of clarity and understanding. Um, and I say that had we had the benefit 
um, of uh, the intermediary report or even the recommendations that the court has now that um, there would have been some thought given to the formulation of the questions so that it was easier um, for the appellant to follow the train. Uh, as I said, the, the appellant was in a room on her own with an electronic bundle um, and, and later, I believe, a paper bundle trying to get to the relevant pages. Well, your client's at the bottom of that page. It, it, um, it says that apart from the apart from the red face, that's all I saw. It, it, indeed. Is that it, it? Is there? Do these points that you're making undermine the reliability of that statement? No, I, I, I don't think they they do, um, my, my lord. No, I don't. Um, I do want to address the court in, in terms of the comments made <coughs> by Her Honour Judge Lisa shortly after that. Uh, and again, I say that that is indicative um, of the judge having, I say, reached a premature um, view um, of the mother. Um, and what she says here is right at the end, um, C249. Um, right, OK, thank you. Can we sort of try and finalise this? The sooner the better. We're running out of time already. So perhaps we could try, and if there is any way of making it quicker, please. Uh, and I say that that's an indication from the judge to, to rush things um, along. Uh, and it's in stark contrast um, to the manner in which the judge treated the mother in the proceedings when she gave her evidence. Um, and of course, my lord, if the courts have the opportunity, and I, I don't wish to go through it, I'm not appealing on behalf of the mother, um, her evidence. Um, the court will see that's very uh, disjointed, uh, very confused. Many of the questions are, are answered with, oh, I don't know, I can't remember, um, and are contradictory. And I'll come on to the contradictions la later uh, in terms of the broad canvas. But what the judge says to the mother, and it's at C156 that I've picked out um, in particular, Between the two hole punches. Yes, um, uh, and uh, the m the mother, having given some of her evidence, um, has been distressed. Um, uh, I am above saying that I will try and not repeat questions already asked, but there's going to be some questions. And the judge's response is, "Well, okay. In that case, we're going to take a break now, um, mother. If you can join us at two o'clock, have something to eat, just calm down. You are doing very well." It's very, very important that you tell me the truth, and it's very important um, that you give your evidence. Um, something has been said that uh, is not picked up for the purposes of the transcript, and the judge responds, I appreciate that, I appreciate that. There's a lot that's been asked of you, but I've got to get um, to the bottom of this. Um, and then uh, a bit further down, I think it's really important that you get the chance to give your evidence with, with, um, which you are doing to so stay calm, have something to eat, have some lunch. And, and I, I say, my Lord, that there is a stark contrast between the judge's view um, and the way she approached the evidence of the appellant um, and the way she approached the evidence um, of the, uh, the, the mother. Uh, moving on to C279, and this is when um, the appellant is answering questions again on behalf of the uh, mother. Sorry, can you pay to reference again? Seven, C279. Yeah. Um, so there is a Yes, it starts at the top um, when it's been suggested to the appellant that she'd tried to blame the school. Um, these were for previous um, marks that were seen on Jay's face some time um, earlier. Um, uh, and it suggested that she wanted to be <coughs> <say> the support <coughs> of the school. Um, and so the answer is, sorry, which part are we talking about now? The question is the same marks, uh, T2, 
to the appellant. Um, and the appellant says, no, we were talking about the blue bruise. Now then we're talking about where he got a toy chucked in his face. So that's two different e injuries. So which one? Um, and then she asks, can you tell me which one you're talking, uh, you're, you're looking at? And then the judge intervenes um, in the middle yes. um, and goes through it. And I say that's another clear indication of the mother's, um, uh, I, I say now, confusion. You, uh, you, and, the appellant's yes, confusion. Yes, the appellant's confusion uh, and difficulty um, with giving her evidence. Um, the um, appellant is asked at 283, and I am coming soon to the end of these uh, um, <coughs> indications, but at 283, um, what is said there is she, she's asked, and uh, she's, she's asked, I would say, that um, uh, an ambiguous question. Um, it's just so we are clear, you know about the mother's past, do you not? And the answer is, no, apparently not. And then the question is, well, you know about, uh, and the rest of the sentence isn't there. And the appellant replies, she told me a story. Whether it was true or not, I don't know. Uh, the question is, she carries a story that she, something in prison to, to support police prosecution, she told me she was sleeping with a man and her husband came in and caught her. And then she's told, that is not the question that I asked. Well, in fairness to the appellant, the, the question was fairly broad. That's the answer that was given. Um, and then it suggested that this is not the question that was asked and that it's a ploy on behalf of the appellant um, to uh, deflect um, away from herself. And it suggested um, that this is, if she doesn't like the questions, then this is what she does. And, and, and I say, well, that that's in itself is something that the judge... Um, uh, adopted in her judgment in, in that she was deflective and sought to blame um, the mother in these proceedings. And I say it's another clear uh, under, uh, example of the mother, not the appellant, not understanding um, what was being asked to her. Um, if we move on, um, the, he the um, appellant is asked um, about a video um, that, she, that was referred to in oral evidence um, that was sent to the appellant uh, by a third party um, which, ev which was alleged to evidence the mother and the father in the father's van during the proceedings and it's clear that the appellant uh, I say got lost uh, in this line of questioning um, at C290 when she, she's asked about um, the, the video. Um, and it's when it is explained to her what the video is, that the question starts off um, with, a, with a large paragraph. Uh, I was starting with a question that related to matters that were dealt with this morning, and I'm asking you these questions just to let you know, because I will be suggesting that you have lied throughout these proceedings, you have lied to the court, and you continue to lie. The question relates to the video that you say you have of the mother that we sent you. Which you I, I haven't found where you're reading from. So. Oh, I, my apologies, my lord. 289, I was the wrong page. 289, I Got it, thank you. It's the, the, the large paragraph, I'm there. an ultimate cue. Thank you. And then the question finally comes, now do you accept that you have lied to the court in relation to where that video came? And the answer is, I never said anything about a video. I even went on my old phone to double check and there isn't a video. Uh, and what the appellant is referring to is that um, video that I've just alluded to, um, that is a, an alleged video sent to the appellant during the course of the proceedings of the mother and father together um, it, in the father's van um, when their evidence was that they weren't together and they hadn't seen each other. Um, so the appellant is clearly thinking of that video. That video um, No, my Lord, I, I, I'm so sorry. My submission in, in that respect is, is incorrect, and I, I'm going to start again. There, there was reference in the police disclosure um, to a video that was taken um, by the mother of Jay at the relevant weekend and was sent to um, the appellant, who then provided it to the police. 
that um, video was never um, obtained. Um, it was sought, it was asked for, um, it didn't form part of the police disclosure. Um, that had been put to the mother um, earlier, that there was a video, um, that she hadn't disclosed it, um, and it would have showed marks to um, Joe's face. Um, so I say here, when the appellant answers the question on behalf of the mother, she is referring to the video um, that the police um, record as having received. There was a recording that the mother sent, uh, sorry, the appellant sent, um, but a video was never uh, was received from the police and the appellant didn't recall sending it. However, the question is in, in respect of the video, uh, the alleged video of the mother and father in a van. Um, and I say again that that is indicative of the mother, not the appellant, sorry, not understanding um, the questions that have been put to her. Uh, and at C290, when it's explained, she says, oh, that video. No, the video of the mother walking. I don't know who actually took um, that video. Uh, and my, my final um, example of the mother's uh, difficulty with the questions and her evidence is at C297. Um, and again, it, it's questions um, on behalf of, of, of the, the mother. <coughs> it starts at the top. Um, so if I read the question from the previous page, I give the context. Um, there's a suggestion to, to the appellant that Jay had a bad night. He came back to you. Um, the appellant says it was a bad evening, but he went to sleep and stayed asleep till the morning. And then it suggested that when it was that bad, you did something, did you not? Um, clarification is sought, um, and the question is put again, that during that bad evening, as you have called it, you'd injured him, you'd had enough. The answer is no, no, that didn't happen. And then the, the question here comes, he came back to you, and again I say it's a long question, he came back to you, I suggest, overtired and a bit emotional, he started crying, you could not control him, and I'm not suggesting you did anything deliberate to hurt him, but that night got out of control and you injured him. And the response to that is, no, Jay wasn't out of control that night. And again, the mother, the appellant rather, has misinterpreted um, the question and provided her answer um, to what she thought that she had um, been asked. Uh, and I say that all of those um, uh, difficulties with the mother's evidence um, ha has given rise to the judge's view that the mother, uh, the appellant, um, was deflective in her in her responses, um, so that the, the questions were lost, um, and that she sought to to put the blame, as it were, um, on the other uh, parents. And so, um, finally, in respect of that, uh, my final submission, as I have said earlier, is that had the parties been aware, measures would have been put in place. Consideration to her needs would have been given, questions properly, properly, properly and appropriately framed, um, and likely in those circumstances, I say, or at least um, likely there would have been a different um, outcome. Uh, and I rely, um, as I said at the outset, in the law and respect of my skeleton argument, in particular REM uh, and REN, uh, and the comments of Lady Justice King set out in the skeleton argument at A42-43. And I submit in the light of the above, there was a fundamental breach of the appellant's Article 6 rights and the decisions um, and findings that are made um, by Her Honour Judge Nisa are unjust because of the serious procedural irregularity. Uh, and on that basis, I seek both permission um, to amend the ground of appeal in respect of REM 1, uh, and the event that permission is granted, for those same reasons, I say that the appeal um, should succeed. Thank you. Well, now, um, we've been going for just over an hour, actually just under an hour, uh, but uh, that would seem like a good point for a, a break. Should we say uh, uh, seven minutes? Would that be about right? You won't be able to leave the building, but you might be able to step outside into the corridor. Would okay. that be... A, would that meet uh, the requirements here? Yes, my lord. Thank you very much.
Yes. So where do we go now? Um, my Lord, I, I'm now going to continue with the ground that the court has already provided permission yeah. um, for the appeal to be brought on, um, and, and that is ground two, that the court departed um, from the view of Dr Goddard, in her opinion, in respect of the injuries um, to JD specifically. Yeah, just um, a moment. Yes, um, thank you. Specifically that uh, injuries one and two were inflicted by the appellant after Jay returned to her care um, on the 19th of January and probably in the morning of the 20th of January before he uh, arrived at school. That injuries one and two are likely to have been caused in the same incident when the appellant slapped Jay. Um, and what I say about that is that Dr Goddard um, at C10, what she says there is um, at the bottom it's the, the very last answer to a question um, when she's asked about the mark um, on the ears the port to the left ear in particular being an area of concern so is that part that mark problematic in terms of causation and the answer um, that Dr Goddard gives so is so it isn't an area it isn't the area where bruises are seen more commonly in abused children and in non-abused children and the mechanism might be sort of holding a child by the ear or pinching um, the ear. So it is of, uh, of a concern. Um, she goes on and repeats that, um, that view where she says, uh, it's at C11, one, two, three, the fourth paragraph with an A next to it underneath the top hole punch so I think the red mark which is maybe a bruise to the outer the canal part of the ear for that to be inflicted um, by an adult or by someone holding the ear tightly um, or pinching uh, the ear um, I, I, and I accept um, as set out in Miss Jones Skellington argument um, that Dr Goddard does accept the possibility that it could be a different um, mechani mechanism. Um, in my submission, in that respect, I I in accepting that it's possible, um, anything is possible. Um, it's what is more likely, I say, that well, carries more weight. Well, didn't the judge make this finding on the basis of all the evidence, as she was obliged to do? Dr Goddard's evidence was important, but only part of the evidence. Uh, I I indeed, my lord, and I accept that, uh, uh, and uh, I do accept that the judge had a wide discretion, um, and that she's not bound to um, follow the expert's evidence. Um, but given uh, Dr. Goddard's view in respect of that, um, and that is something that was um, also recorded in respect of Dr. Waddy um, at A8, where it's recorded that he records the, the um, marks to the ears. Uh, as two separate marks, so the, the slap mark and the mark to the ear, as two separate uh, incidents, uh, and the reference for that is at, at A8. Um, Dr. Goddard um, was asked by uh, uh, was was asked questions whether or not if the mark had been there before that particular red mark, um, she would have to, she would she be so concerned? And at, at C49, what she says is that the mark had been there before she would be happy for the red mark being dismissed uh, and what I say in respect of, of that is that the appellant um, says and it's at C208 uh, that the red mark on one side of, of, of Jay's ear um, had been there previously uh, and was still there. It was suggested to the appellant on behalf of the local authority at C210 that um, the appellant hadn't mentioned that mark to Dr. Wadey. The appellant says she did, she's, she's quite clear in her evidence that she did, but that he didn't accept it um, and he said he knew what, what, um, what a bruise was. I say that the appellant's position is supported by the entry log at A13, which is um, a, an account that's taken uh, recently after the injuries had been found. Um, where the mother is recorded, sorry, the appellant is recorded to say that the mark on top of the ear um, had always uh, been there. So I say that in light of, of 
the, the appellant's evidence, the evidence um, before the court that's recorded by the two experts, um, and also um, the recording um, that Mum, the appellant, had reported it um, as being there previously at A13, um, that there is no good basis um, for the judge to have departed from that uh, and found that it was uh, an injury that was caused by um, the appellant. Um, I would say, my Lord, that on the evidence it would have been um, open um, to a reasonable judge to have concluded that that um, red mark uh, that is attributed to the appellant um, was one that ha had been there before. It's certainly referred to in the papers as the school having seen um, a red mark um, on a child's ear previously, and as I said, the appellant's evidence was. Well, are you saying the finding the judge made wasn't open to her on the evidence, uh, or that uh, it was not? Where the, how do you put it? Um, I, 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 actually, I, I frame it in both ways. I say on the evidence, um, it doesn't support the finding, uh, and on that basis, it wasn't open um, for the learned judge to have made um, that finding. And if we then turn um, to the four parallel lines, which um, uh, is referred to as the slap, um, it, it was suggested to Dr. Goddard that Jay had had a similar injury before at C42 of two parallel lines, one thicker than another, noted at, at school. And Dr. Goddard at C43 differentiates between those marks that disappeared very quickly, saying there can be marks to the face. Um, but going back to these marks at the face of the child protection medical, they were very different, um, again, uh, from uh, those incidents. Um, turning to the injury to Jay's arm, um, so that is the, the, the burn injury, uh, as, as it is referred to, the abrasion scrape um, mark, um, the judge found that that um, occurred as a lack of supervision. Yes. It's submitted that Dr. Goddard's view in respect of the burn from a radiator, because that was the case that was put on behalf of the mother, that the child had fallen um, on the radi against the radiator and potentially burned uh, an arm. I believe on behalf of the father it was put, it might have been a, a scraping sort of burn mark from going down um, a slide. Uh, and Dr. Goddard addressed both of those um, scenarios. And at C39, in terms of whether it could be a friction burn, what Dr. Goddard says is that you'd expect to see a kind of friction with a tailing, um, so a tailing off for, or, of an injury in, in respect of that. Um, she goes on to say that it would be a painful injury, and she compares it to another injury um, that's recorded in the um, school logs, uh, my lord, where... Um, Jay is recorded to have scraped skin off his face and he was really distressed uh, and she says that this injury, the burn um, as we call it to the forearm looks of the same degree of painfulness and she says she'd be surprised if the child didn't cry when they had this injury uh, and the mother's evidence um, uh, at all points um, has been that the child did not cry um, when, when he was in her care. I will come on to the inconsistencies um, in respect of what the mother says um, when I address you in respect of the broad canvas. And so, uh, as I said uh, previously, whilst I accept that the court does not have to accept the evidence of the medical <coughs> expert and can reach a, a different conclusion, looking at the evidence, um, it's difficult to see um, how Her Honour Judge Nisa arrived uh, at the conclusion that those two marks, or sorry, that mark um, and the two explanations, possible explanations provided, um, uh, led to a finding um, of uh, unreasonable lack of supervision as opposed to an inflicted injury. I accept that Dr. Goddard had said that if there had been a plausible um, explanation, it could have been an accident. Um, but in the absence of that, absence of that. Um, it was likely to be considered uh, inflicted. And what I say is in that in reaching her conclusions, the judge has not provided a, a, any reasoned judgment as to why she chose to depart um, from the view of, of Dr. Goddard, what she based her findings on, um, uh, other than um, it would appear that uh, the judge finds that the, the, the mother in the proceedings 
um, was under the influence of drugs on, on the occasion in question uh, and therefore didn't, the judge found, hear um, the child cry. Um, if I move on then, um, my Lord, to ground three, yes. that the court has erred in its application um, of the facts, uh, as previously alluded to, um, the judge did accept and amend um, her finding in respect of, of that, um, and that the judge has amended to find that um, the appellant used ketamine the weekend of January the 19th of 20, uh, 1920. Um, this, this ground is all about the drugs, is it? This ground, you, 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 well, yes. Does that now, for, uh, it, it, I assume we're going to be, on this ground, we're going to be invited to um, uh, allow the appeal on the, on, the, on the basis of this finding. Is that right? Yeah, yes. Well, then, do you need to say very much more about it? Well... The, the judge has amended her, her finding to yes. say that um, she accepts, uh, as I said earlier, some part of, of what was, was raised with her in respect to the intervener's, uh, sorry, the appellant's evidence, um, that the hair strand uh, length wasn't inter interfered with um, by the intervener. However, um, in terms of that finding, I say it goes further in, in that the judge erred in her application of, of facts. Um, and what I say in respect of, of that is um, this, is that the, the judge has based, when she gave her amended judgment, um, what the judge says it is that um, taking the, the appellant's evidence with the evidence um, or, or what is put in the expert report that it can take three to four months um, for, the, for the drug to leave a hair strand test um, after cessation of um, regular taking and sometimes up to six months. Um, and that was the uh, appellant's um, evidence when she was questioned about did she or did she not accept those drug results. Um, the judge concluded that on that basis um, it would suggest that the appellant had used drugs um, in January. Um, I, I say that's a misinterpretation of what's actually uh, in okay. the report. So the finding is now, the, the judge's amended finding is, have I got this right, the appellant's use, the appellant's use of ketamine was higher than she admitted and for a longer period of time she used ketamine over the weekend of the 18th and 19th of January. Yes. Do you accept that finding? Or that, not? that finding has been accepted, uh, and um, my understanding is that the judge has amended yes. that. Yes, do you accept recent. that? Yes, it's accepted that that's the finding the judge made. I don't accept okay. that it's a right finding. Oh, I'm, no, that's what I mean. Do you accept, so you're, you're appealing against that finding? Yes. Okay, so what do you, what do you say the judge should have found? Um, uh, well, what I say that the evidence doesn't point, the, there, there isn't the evidence for the judge to have made that finding that the appellant used um, ketamine for um, longer th than she said she did, um, but certainly not that the appellant was using uh, ketamine in January. Um, so, my Lord, I, I'm, I ask you to turn to paragraph E7, sorry, to E7, paragraph 6.2. E7. E7, paragraph 6.24. This is the part of, of the um, expert report that, that sets out um, some clarification in, in terms of the hair strand test. Uh, and what is said here is that when an individual has regularly used the drug, stops and continues to abstain from using the drug, it can take on average three to four months for a person to return and not de detected results. In, however, in some cases, it can take up to six months. Uh, and what I say is that the, the learned judge ha has misinterpreted that to mean that if there's a positive um, result, it, it could be positive for the six months um, previous to that. Uh, and I say that's a, a, an incorrect interpretation of, of those um, results. Um, the appellant um, 
the appellant's um, hair strand test um, was positive um, for the end of February to the end of March, um, and then decreasing amounts from March to April and April to May. So some four to eight weeks after the appellant says she stopped um, using ketamine um, and the subsequent reduction, uh, and it's indicated that there's a large reduction when it's initially um, stopped and, there, and thereafter a smaller reduction um, until you get to uh, a, a negative. Uh, and what they say here is a large decrease, approximately 85% would be expected after the first month. Of course, um, we don't have uh, necessarily, we don't have before fe February. Um, once an individual stops using, followed by smaller decreases until a not detected result um, is obtained. And of course, the, the, the appellant's um, drug uh, results are at E5 um, and are recorded. Um, from the end of February to the end of March has been 0.84. Do I have, do I, uh, yes, it's different E's, it's two E's. Yes, there's some repagination there from it's the lower the, page, it's the lower page. yes, um, sorry. Uh, and at the top we can see the end of February to the end of March um, is 0.84. What we don't have is from the end of January to the end of February, and of course it's in that period of February that the intervener, uh, the appellant, says that she was using ketamine on a regular basis um, at that point, and her evidence was uh, every other day. Um, and then she stopped once she was aware that she could have the, the children returned to her care. Uh, and what I say, if we look then above, there's a, a significant drop from the end of March to the end of April to 0.63, another drop to 0.37, before by the end of May we are barely over, barely over um, the, the cutoff report reporting, and so I say that those um, results support what the um, appellant um, had said her consumption was, but the, and, but they certainly don't um, indicate that the, the appellant was using um, ketamine in January at the relevant time that these injuries occur. And I say that there is nothing um, in the evidence for the judge to reach that conclusion. Um, in terms of, of the other evidence um, that was available to the court in respect of, of uh, ketamine, um, the judge referred to in her judgment that there were his extensive historic um, uh, incidents or recordings of, of the mother sorry, the appellant using ketamine, and I set out in my skeleton argument, that's not accepted uh, as being factually correct. There is one incident in 2019 that's reported more than once, which is disputed um, by the appellant as to what was said um, to whom in respect of that. Uh, and in the uh, amended judgment, I want to judge Anissa accepts that, that um, it's a disputed fact that the appellant did not have the opportunity to challenge that and that she should pay, place limited weight on it. Um, in terms of the father's um, suggestion that the uh, uh, appellant um, was uh, under the influence of ketamine when he dropped Jay back, um, again, the judge accepts that he didn't attend um, to give evidence. His evidence could not be challenged. Um, and she says in her amended judgment that um, whilst it's a consideration, she hasn't placed um, particular weight on that. The only other uh, references other than from the, the, the mother in the proceedings were from two of the mother's friends um, who spoke uh, to a, a social worker of R, uh, as it were at the time, um, and gave um, uh, indications that uh, the appellant um, was a regular ketamine user. Um, the the, the uh, social worker that gave evidence confirmed that um, she got the impression that the, um, the, the two other mothers that were providing the information to her um, ha had got this information from the mother and had not had any first-hand... The mother, meaning the mother. The mother, the mother-mother, the proper mother in the proceedings, um, and had not um, see, had any first-hand knowledge of the appellant um, taking drugs. The, uh, the learned judge in her judgment accepted that whilst this was hearsay evidence which was admissible, 
um, she was placing limited weight on it, given that okay. the, the two witnesses. Well, the judge, the judge relied on the totality of the evidence when assessing this issue, including the evidence given by your client. Um, my lord, what I say is that is that she relied on evidence. Um, I say she must have to have reached the conclusion that she did. Um, evidence that she herself said she should place little weight on and should be cautious. Um, she also relied on the on what your, what your client said, which she didn't accept. Uh, leave aside ground one for the moment. Assume that it, for the purposes of were against you on ground one. Wasn't it open to the judge to take to take into account her view of your client's evidence as part? Indeed, with her, she was obliged to do that as part of the totality of the evidence. And was it therefore open to her to come to the finding, the amended finding, that she's now provided? Well, my Lord, I, I would say no, that, that it's not, um, on the basis that in considering the appellant's evidence, um, one must look at what she said. She was very candid um, about uh, drug use in February when her children were not with her. Um, she, she gave... Um, extensive, I would say, information about uh, taking ketamine every other day. She did not need to do that. She could simply have said, you know, yes, I took some on one or two occasions, but she didn't. Um, but she is clear that she, she didn't take it um, once she knew that the children were going to be returned to her care. Um, so again, it brings me back to um, the judge providing herself with a, a Lucas direction in terms of the appellant having lied about her use initially, um, a, and then applying it, I say, to the mother's to the appellant's evidence um, in respect of what her use was, uh, and I say there is no evidence base that was before the judge, no reliable evidence base um, before the judge uh, for her to have concluded that the mother was sorry, the appellant was lying um, about her her uh, level of drug use at that time and certainly nothing to suggest that she was using in um, January. The court had the benefit of some CCTV footage um, which whilst it, it was obtained for the purpose of, of identifying whether there are any marks to Jay's face, um, unfortunately uh, it cut off at 3.45 uh, instead of 4 o'clock uh, as suggested by um, the, the appellant. Um, and so although the, the, the appellant and Jay were seen in the shop together, Jay's face was not seen. However, the mother was. Um, she appeared the, to... The, sorry, the appellant was. She appeared to be um, fully in, in, in control of, of her faculties. She wasn't falling over the place. Um, she <coughs> did not appear um, on video to be intoxicated, and it certainly wasn't put to her by any party that her, she had the appearance of being under the influence um, of any drugs in that video. Um, we also have extensive text messages between the appellant and the mother, um, which again um, is indicative that the appellant was in a, a sound mind. Um, she was able to, to compose those text messages. They're fluent. Um, she exchanges multiple ones um, with the mother, both prior to dropping Jay to her and then afterwards, and they continue on into the evening. Um, as they do the day, um, the Sunday, um, before Jay is dropped back to the to the appellant, there there is multiple text messages um, between the appellant uh, and the mother, all indicative of a coherent um, appellant. And therefore, I say on the evidence before the court, the judge was wrong to make that finding. The evidence didn't support it, uh, and I <coughs> say that um, she she shouldn't have gone that far. Uh, I'm going to move on, um, my lord, to ground four. Yes. Um, that the court uh, has fallen into speculation. Um, this this, this uh, ground somewhat overlaps with all, all that has been um, said uh, previously. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat the submissions that I've made in respects of grounds two uh, uh, and three here. Um, but in terms of, of the, the slap um, to the face that was put down to the appellant, um, on the basis that she failed to report at the earliest opportunity. What I say there, as I, I, I said previously, is that the appellant has been consistent um, in what she says in, in respect of that. 
At A2, she says she saw marks and didn't know what to do. Um, when she dropped at school, she says she saw another mother um, and she asked her what she thought and she told her to call the social and she went home, called social and thereafter. Yeah. Um, what words, I think you've got to show what words you rely on in your support of your submission that the judge was speculating. Uh, well, I say it has to be um, speculative um, because in itself a, a, a delay or a failure to report is not indicative that um, a person... Well, there's a difference between it. speculation and a legitimate inference. And the judge here drew an inference, didn't she? She wasn't speculating. Oh, that. My Lord, I, I say she was speculating because the evidence doesn't support that. There, there is nothing I say on the evidence to support that uh, this uh, uh, appellant um, has caused that injury. Uh, and saying that um, it's because there was a delay um, in reporting it, um, or that she didn't text um, the mother uh, or, or um, ask her. But if there had uh, been a, 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 a 24 hour delay, say, and the, the, judge, the judge concluded from that, inferred from that, that the, the mother, <laughs> there was a reason why the mother had not reported it, you know, a, long, a longer delay. You wouldn't say, would you say that was speculation as opposed to a legitimate well, inference? Well, no, n not at that stage, my lord, because the, the, a long delay such as that um, does raise the question of, of why is there the delay. In, in terms of this short delay, and, and I'm just going to come on to say that whilst the, the appellant didn't recall it, and it only came out in her evidence, um, is that it's when she was asked about a telephone number um, and who had she called at 9.40 in her oral evidence. Um, and when she came back into court, um, the appellant identified that as her family support worker. So she called a family support worker um, at 9.40. Um, she called the, uh, the local authority. Um, she didn't tell the school first. She told the school after the local authority. Um, and some criticism was made of her for not telling the school mm. first. Um, I, I say on her behalf that, that it's, it's not... Um, well, can I suggest that, in fact, you're, uh, maybe I'm wrong here, but you're, you're, this ground is not that she was speculating, but that she drew the wrong inference. You're saying she shouldn't have drawn the inference from the 40-minute delay that the mother was trying to hide something. Um, my Lord, I, I would accept that. that Isn't that I would what accept you're saying? That. I would accept that. I have, ter I have termed it speculation, but uh, I, I am happy to accept Well, the judge use, does use the word, one wonders why. That's yes. the phrase she yes. uses, which stands out. But and she uses that on a couple of occasions yes. in her judgment, one wonders why, in respect of, of the injuries um, and the person that, that she saw. But I've termed it speculation, um, but my submission is that she, she shouldn't have drawn... Um, those conclusions, uh, or, or uh, I'm happy to term it, that well, the inference... How, what, what factors do you say she f she should have taken into account, which she didn't take into account when drawing that inference? inference? Well, now, uh, my Lord, of course, I would say... Yeah, leaving aside ground one. But it, it, it was a short period no. um, of time. It was a very short period of time. Um, on the appellant's evidence, the child came home um, in the evening uh, and was distressed. Uh, and that is also um, borne out by what the father said um, in his evidence. He said that when um, Jay saw the mother, he started screaming um, and crying. He says the child didn't want to leave him, whereas the appellant says as soon as the child saw her, um, she, he started crying and wanted to come. Um, to her that his face was bright red all parties accept that Jay had a bright red face um, that is accepted um, by all, all parties um, uh, and in terms of that red face and the mother not noticing it when he came home um, what Dr Goddard said in, in respect of that it, is that uh, it's at C61 there are reports of people thinking he had a red face the redness of that area would have been more, um, you know, on one side. And I think an observant parent in a reasonable light would have noticed that there was a difference. The, the appellant in her answers to questions from Miss Stone says that she didn't notice the mark on, on his face because he was cuddled up to her. 
uh, it's at C230, when ex asked in re-examination how he was cuddled up, um, the appellant described that the right side of his face as being upwards to her and, and him being cradled um, in her arm. Um, at C306, in answers to questions from the children's guardian, um, the appellant says that the lights in my flat are quite dull, so my lighting is not bright, uh, and that's at C305. Uh, and so um, my submission is that in all the circumstances uh, are set out, the fact that the mother didn't notice the bruising isn't indicative um, that she caused the injury. The, ap the, the appellant. Delay, the appellant. Yes, I'm sorry, the appellant um, didn't cause the injury. And that the delay in the appellant reporting it, it was such a short um, delay uh, that the mother in her evidence accepts that she made a poor choice. Uh, and I, I submit on her behalf that that's absolutely right. She made a poor choice, um, but that is not indicative of her having caused the injury. And I say that the, the learned judge went too far in finding um, that she did on the basis of that short delay. The first, the first contact with anyone in social services we, we know now is at 9.40 to a family support worker. The mother's evidence, what, sorry, the appellant's evidence was she wanted to give the mother the opportunity to tell her what had happened um, before she did, did anything. Um, and she'd want, waited to see her outside of, of her other child's school, um, but she didn't turn up. Uh, and there is a later telephone call where the appellant says the mother w w was in incoherent on the phone, uh, and it's after that that she telephoned um, to children's services uh, uh, and the school. And I say on that basis, um, the judge has fallen, I say, into speculation that she's gone further um, than she should, uh, drawing the inferences she has. Um, and that the finding um, that is made by her honour judge, Nisa, that the mother, uh, sorry, the appellant caused the, the slap mark, um, it, it is one that she, she w was not open for her to make um, on the evidence. All right. Does that complete ground four? That does. So we're on to ground five. <coughs> <laughs> this, five, this overlaps again with things you've said already, doesn't it? It, it does. I, I don't intend to, to repeat them other than to say that in, in the, um, the judge's reasoning um, as to um, why one injury, and I accept that there is an error in the skeleton argument as pointed out by um, Miss Stone where it refers to the injury being inflicted uh, by the mother. It, it's the injury, it should read the injury occurred in the care um, of the mother um, and or the father. Um, but in terms of reaching those conclusions, uh, my submission is the judge's reasoning is very confused in this matter. O on the one hand, um, she uh, says that um, the appellant should have noticed the slaps, the slap marks, the injuries um, to Jay's face when he came home. Okay, uh, you're going to have to help me with paragraph 60 of your skeleton. How do we... Does that need to be amended in terms of it does, who yes. is who? Yes, so that, that, that um, line should read... Who is M? Well, I beg your pardon? Who is M? Is, do you mean the mother? Or, do, or should that be the appellant? That should be the... Yes, that should be the appellant. So that should be... In both times where it says M, capital M, is that right? That should be A. Yes. And where you say mother in line four, that should be the appellant. Yes, it should. And you name the mother, the mother in paragraph 60, yes. and that is the mother. That is the mother, yes. And by inflicted, that it was caused, in the, caused in the care of. It's re referred to um, correctly earlier yes. in the skeleton argument, but it is incorrect there, as rightly pointed out by uh, Miss Stone. I, I, I don't, I don't appeal or seek to appeal findings made in respect of, of the mother. 
um, I no. draw the court's attention um, to the judge's reasoning in that she puts the mark by the side of the ear <laughs> down to the mother on the basis that um, she didn't raise an issue with the appellant when Jay came into her care. Yeah, um, just, forgive me, about the, I'm still confused about... In paragraph 60, line 2, is the first M mother or appellant? That's appellant. Okay, so all the M's are both M's. The M's are, okay. are appellant. All right, carry on, carry on. Yes, so, uh, well, as I, as I was saying, the, um, the, the judge attributed the, the mark um, on the side of the face, uh, the, the burn mark, uh, as it suggested, um, to occurring in the care of either the mother or the father on the basis that um, this was a mother who loved this little boy and had he come into her care with a mark, one, she would have seen it, um, but she would also have um, raised it with uh, the appellant. Um, the judge used the, the um, same uh, reasoning, it would seem, that because the uh, appellant hadn't noticed um, the marks uh, on the side of the face, that uh, she was responsible for the slap mark, although the judge does reference that the appellant also didn't see the um, burn mark. Um, so looking at the, uh, and I can be no clearer than that, I'm afraid, my lord, because the judgment is no clearer than that in, as to how the judge came to determine that one injury was caused um, in the care of the mother and, and or father and that the other one um, was a, a, occurred in the care of the appellant. And for those reasons, um, I, I say um, that the um, background um, it, it is made out uh, and I would um, seek that the court um, find that there wasn't any basis in the evidence um, for those um, findings. And in support of that, um, I would wish to address you in respect of the discrepancies and inconsistencies. There are numerous ones. I don't intend to go through all of them in terms of the um, parents' evidence um, and what is said in, in relation to that. When um, the mother is asked, uh, and some of these uh, dis discrepancies don't relate specifically to the injury, although they are in um, the evidence, but they, get, they go to the broad canvas of what the evidence was before the court um, in terms of the findings that were, were, were made. Um, it's the, um, it was suggested to the appellant that she'd enrolled um, Jay on a Makaton course in an effort to get him to say injuries had happened in the, in the mother and father's care. Uh, and that goes um, to the judge's finding that the, the mother, that's where the appellant did all that she could to um, set the parents, if you like, in the frame uh, of that. However, um, there is reference in the paper, and I have to come back with the reference for you, my lord, in that um, the school report notes that in January, 20th of January, that the, the, the mother and the child were enrolled on a Makaton course. So I say that that enrolment on the course far preceded um, any um, attempts, as it were, uh, for any blame to be diverted away from the appellant, as at that stage there was no proceedings um, and she wasn't interviewed by the police and not considered um, a suspect. In terms of, of the mother, um, what she says at age 26 in her police interview is that she had um, Jay um, since he was six months old. She'd had him overnight. Um, and at age 27, she said it had been every weekend. And she repeats that at age 56. And um, my Lord, we know that that is not true. Uh, uh, after extensive questioning on behalf of the local authority, the, the mother accepted that that was a, an untruth that, that she had told and she couldn't explain why um, she had said that. Um, she was asked whether she communicated with the appellant um, that weekend, um, and what she says at age 49 is that she texts the appellant, but she never got a response. Um, and we know from the extensive text messages within the bundle that it is also um, not true. 
in interview, the officer specifically asked the mother if she'd told the appellant about what marks that um, he had, uh, that Jay had on him. Um, and what she says is, I told her about the ones I knew about. And of course, this contradicts what the mother said in her evidence um, and what she said to other professionals in that she didn't um, tell the mother or raise it with, sorry, the appellant or raise it with her, uh, with the mark that the mother says was there when she collected Jay. Mum in, in her, the mother in her interview says that Jay had a mark to his face. She refers to it being <coughs> a burn, um, and she gives an example to the judge that it could have happened accidentally by running into a cigarette, which, uh, in my submission, it, it, it is um, an unusual uh, uh, reason to, to put forward. She said that she didn't ask the appellant about it, as the appellant was off her face at H31. She says that. Well, Lord, I've already addressed you in respect yes. of... Now, where, what precisely do these points go to? These well, are arguments... You're, you're now saying the judge should not have accepted mother's account, the mother's account. I, I'm saying that when looking at the broad canvas of all the evidence that was available um, to, to the learned judge, it, it's submitted on behalf of the local authority and supported by the mother, that it was open to the judge, that the evidence was there for her to make, uh, and she had a discretion to make all the findings that she did. Uh, and I say that the broad canvas doesn't support that. Uh, and that's why uh, I am referring yes. to the... Yes. I mean, these points go beyond what you put in your skeleton, don't they? You've not... <coughs> this is a slightly different tack, isn't it? Underground well, five. No, uh, it, it's not identified or itemised in my skeleton argument, but I, I say it's relative. And at the course of, at the time that the um, skeleton argument was prepared on behalf of the appellant, we didn't have the benefit um, of the transcripts. Uh, it was it was uh, drafted sometime back in July, and unfortunately not um, uh, in o October or, or November. Um, so it, it it may go slightly outside, but I say it goes to to the same to the same um, point. There is a reference made in my Skellington, um, and it's towards the the end of it where I say. Paragraph 68. Yes, that the, the judge having heard the mother's evidence and found, having found her to be a confused and inconsistent witness failed to give a proper evaluation of the wider canvas and examination of the surrounding circumstances. Um, and it's that that I say that, that these um, inconsistencies go to because they're not minor inconsistencies, my Lord. There, there is no part, I say, of the mother or the father's evidence that is consistent um, I say that there, there is no part of their evidence that supports um, the finding that the learned judge made um, that the injury to the face, the slap injury, occurred in the care of the appellant. Uh, and I say that there is much evidence to suggest that this, this injury occurred as the result of the child being caught in, in a verbal altercation whilst in the care of the mother uh, and or the father. In particular, I refer to the uh, text message from the mother sent uh, just after one o'clock in the morning to her friend saying that the father had hit her, followed swiftly by a message to the appellant saying that um, Josh had just gone to bed um, and that he, uh, I beg your pardon, that Jay yeah. had just gone to bed um, and that Jay didn't like the father. Um, right. Now, you've been going for nearly two hours. I'm, I'm nearly break, there. And you're coming to count ground six, it seems to me, are you? I, I'm trying. I, I, I'm mindful. I, I, have, I, have, I have seen the indication of, of the time, and I'm trying to roll it all into one now. Yes, so, so ground six. Yes. Are we there? We are, I'm in the middle of ground six. Okay, yes. so now we're talking Rounding about fail, yes. failure to give proper consideration to the yes. father's failure to give evidence. Yes. Um, and you cite Mr. Justice Johnson and his dicta about the inference to be drawn. That's been. Um, to some extent modified by subsequent decisions, hasn't it? It, it has, yes, uh, my lord. But what I say in respect of, of that it, is that um, this was a, a father who um, didn't engage fully in the proceedings, I say. He uh, didn't engage in the hair strand testing till very late in the day, and I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm wrong. Um, but that was, uh, I understand, in December, um, his statement to the court 
again came in uh, very late uh, in, in the day um, uh, and <coughs> is then um, in light of that uh, a, a father who attends some of the hearing um, but then um, attends no more, plays no further part in it despite being invited, despite knowing, despite the best efforts of his instructing solicitor, knowing the importance, knowing what the findings um, or what findings are being sought on behalf of the local authority. Um, I, I say that the, the inference should properly have been drawn, that this is such a case where the father's failure to engage um, to come to court, to give his evidence, um, to allow his evidence to be tested is such that um, the court should have drawn an adverse I I inference um, that he uh, uh, was responsible for the injuries um, to Joshua uh, and in support of that, my Lord, where I was going um, before we moved on to that is that we have the text messages uh, and it is my from the, violent, the, the evidence of a yes. violent incident. Yes, um, and we also have um, the mother uh, recording in, both in her police interview and in her oral evidence that if Josh is, um, if she tries to leave, sorry, she tries to leave Jay in R's room to sleep um, overnight, he screams his head off. Uh, and in answers to questions on behalf of the appellant, um, when the when the mother was asked, is that what happened on this occasion? he was screaming his head off, uh, the answer is yes. Um, so I say with that, with the knowledge that there was a violent incident between the mother and father at a time that we know that uh, Josh, uh, yeah. sorry, I'm sorry, that Jay was up um, uh, in the middle of the night um, and that he had been screaming his head off, I say that the judge could properly have drawn the inference and should Could, have but the judge had this, I'm sorry. The judge had this in, in mind, didn't she? She knew about this. She refers to this. Um, the judge could's finds not, that could's not good enough, Ms. Kelly. You've got to show that the judge should I say and was wrong not have. to. I say she should have and that she was wrong not to. I say the evidence, my Lord, is there. Um, I, I say that is the finding that, that she should have made um, and that if she couldn't identify which of the parents was responsible um, for that uh, those slap marks, those injuries, um, then the judge should have made a call finding in respect of the parents. Um, and, and for all of those reasons, um, my Lord, finally, uh, I say that um, the appellant's uh, uh, appeal should be allowed. And if the appeal is allowed, what course do you invite us to take? Uh, if the court's with me and allows the, the appellant's appeal, then... Um, my primary position on, on, on behalf of the appellant uh, as her wish is, is that the, the findings made against the appellant are set aside. Um, uh, I understand that the local authority wouldn't oppose a pool finding. Um, the appellant would also not uh, oppose a pool finding. It's not what she seeks, but she wouldn't oppose a pool finding if the court were with me um, and allowed the, the appeal to proceed. Well, just a moment. Your case is that your client, should, the judge, should have reached, should have exonerated your client, should have excluded your client from the pool. I it, it, it is, and my my primary position is that those findings should be set aside, and that if the local authority wish to pursue them, they can properly do so in the proceedings in respect of Jay. Um, I understand. Well, that well, just a moment. What then happens? So, the, if the findings are set aside, should there be a re a rehearing of these? Of, this of these the, findings? The difficulty, my Lord, with that as, as I see it is that I, I understand um, from the paperwork filed on behalf of the mother that the proceedings in respect of R have concluded with a final order some time ago, yes. um, um, which has not been appealed. Um, so the court would have to consider the proportionality of reopening closed proceedings to retry uh, a, a, an issue in terms of facts. Well, we could remit, and I think he allowed it, I haven't discussed this with my colleagues, but we could remit the matter to a, a judge, or it would be another judge, Judge Rayside is the, uh, yes. the DFJ, to decide, A, whether there should be a rehearing, and if so, the scope of it. Yes. In the light of submissions yes. that may be made. That, yes. that would be... That, that's certainly uh, a course that's open um, to the court. I understand that, that um, if the 
court is with me uh, that the mother's uh, the appellant's appeal should succeed, that the mother um, would seek a, a, a retrial. Yes, I understand that from. And I suppose if there was a rehearing, it could be they could be rolled together. The two the fact, the same fact finding hearing. Uh, well, they're probably different facts as also which they rely on. In the case of your cl in, in the proceedings, well, those facts are relied on uh, as part of, of threshold in, in in the proceedings in respect of Jay, which is is why. Um, I say on behalf of the appellant, uh, it is important that the, the court, very important that those findings are safe and appropriate uh, and findings that are made upon the evidence because of the impact yes, but the, they have. Could the, could the proceedings be heard together, both sets of proceedings? If, if we allowed the appeal and remitted the matter for a rehearing, could there be one fact-finding hearing involving both families? That, that's quite unwieldy. There is a, obviously a, a great overlap between the two cases on the facts. Do you want to think about that and let yes. me know what you're saying? Yes, the y yes. Um, okay, I, all right. I, I would like Perhaps to talk about it on. with Miss Stone. It would be good to have a common position on that. Unless I can assist any further. Ms. Kelly, can I just ask you about points that aren't under appeal in the schedule? Because um, having listened to what you've just got to say <coughs> now, specifically number nine, <coughs> which is that um, appellant and mother so it was found lie to do what each could do to implicate the other. As I've understood your submissions, you're really saying that that's, that's not fair. I mean, that really goes to, that underpins the judge's conclusion that um, it was your client um, who was trying to implicate mother, and that's why she lied about the slap in the face. Indeed. I mean, that's the point. But so, so what about number nine? That must, I mean, it, it can't stand, I know it's on your submissions, and I don't understand how that's not under challenge. And you could say a little bit the same about seven and eight as well, I think. Six, no, seven, and eight. seven and eight. So six is um, uh, uh, this framing. supervision. But as I understand, you've just said your ground six is that um, uh, the but the arm burn is nothing to do with lack of supervision. This is Jay getting caught in a crossfire in a fight between two warring parents. It, it is, but but I don't seek to appeal that on, on behalf of, of the appellant. Um, so likewise with ground seven, um, the the remaining injuries, so the, the small bruises yeah. uh, and scratches, um, yes, in light of Dr Goddard's evidence, I don't think that, that there is a proper challenge um, to be made in respect of that finding. Um, I, I accept um, what is said in respect of um, just finding the... Uh, but eight, I mean, you accept that, that there are inconsistent accounts... Yes, that, that you, there are, you, you say there are minor, in, minor inconsistencies, I say, on behalf of, of the appellant, but there are um, some inconsistencies. But again, I say that that is a reflection um, of her cognitive difficulties and, and her understanding. What about nine, that the intervening appellant has lied to implicate the mother? That's what it says. And um, mother, too. Yes, yes, the other way around. But yeah, but you're concerned, yeah. 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 But, but what about on reflection and in light of my submissions, um, I would seek a permission to amend uh, the grounds to include that uh, that um, finding um, as being one that is. It's not the grounds you need. Well, it's, it's the it's, finding. It, it's, yeah. the, it's the you invite us to set aside yes. that finding as well. But really, your point is that if we're with you on the appeal, and particularly on ground one. The whole of the process is tainted, and there should indeed. be a rehearing. That's yeah. your principal argument, isn't it? I, indeed, or if not a rehearing, uh, or at least the matter remitted to determine. Yes. They should be the, the findings should be set aside. Yes, that, that is my primary position. And the matter remitted to the judge, to another judge, to decide whether there should be a rehearing, and if so, the scope of it. Indeed, my lord. Can I say any further? Anything else? Yeah. Just, just one thing, if I may. Coming back to ground one. Who typically will make the assessment that there's a need for um, an intermediary? Who will ask the assessment to be made? Um, it can be either the instructed solicitor who would normally have more uh, contact with the client, but, but equally um, counsel can, can raise that yes. uh, and then in discussion um, between both uh, come to a, a decision as to whether or not um, a cognitive assessment. Usually it's the instructed solicitor, but counsel can raise it as an issue. And in this case, it was the same solicitor throughout? It was, yes, my lord. Uh, my concern is only this, that if 
if we now say, well, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, we'd quite like to have had an assessment, uh, wh why isn't that going to happen every time somebody gives evidence that the judge hasn't liked? Um, I don't think it's just a case of, of the um, appellant giving uh, evidence um, that's not the judge hasn't liked. I, I think in this case, it, issues became apparent later on. Because the appellant was an intervener, um, she dropped out of those proceedings immediately after the fact-finding hearing. The, the hearing took place um, in the midst of, of the global pandemic. Yeah. Everything was remote. We had some issues with connectivity. Um, uh, neither myself nor my instructing solicitor met the appellant uh, in person. You did not? I was going to no. ask that. You no, hadn't I met, met for the first time. Your solicitor today. hadn't met her. No, and my, my solicitor still has not. Uh, as far as I understand, I have met for the first time this today. Morning. So hindered by that lack of face-to-face -face, um, contact. Um, but but um, also, uh, and in addition um, to that, I said it wasn't until later when going through um, findings, evidence, in respect of the proceedings for Jay that it became more apparent that there was an issue or, or appeared to be an issue uh, in understanding. Um, it was known, uh, and it is accepted that it was known, that the appellant um, said she suffered from dyslexia, and, and you'll have seen in the psychological report that Dr. Joslin um, suggests that uh, a further assessment of that might be indicated. And for that reason, um, it, it, in any event, um, care is taken with giving advice and taking instructions. Um, and so on a go-slow basis with somebody who has dyslexia, there is even less opportunity, I say, to identify um, a cognitive assessment when you are an intervener and, and not, as it were, um, someone who is engaged in the day-to-day -day, um, proceedings um, and evaluations um, of, of the social work team. Thank you. I'm grateful. Thank you very much, Ms Kelly. Ms Kelly, I, unless you uh, would like another break, I would propose we continue to one o'clock now. We start Miss Stone. Yes. Is that all right? Yes. Thank okay. you. Yes, Miss Stone. My Lord, I'm grateful. Perhaps if I can start with the proposed amended ground yes, one. Yes, and what is your position now on that? Uh, in respect of that ground, the local authority does not oppose permission to amend the grounds, but does oppose um, permission being granted to appeal on the basis it has no real prospect of success. Um, and even if permission is granted, the local authority says that the appeal should not succeed. So. If my Lord is content, I propose to deal with both of those yes. aspects. Together. Roll up those, up, those on Indeed. your argument yes. together. Um, first of all, a number of matters have been raised that I just would like to deal with um, shortly, which were not raised in my learned friend's skeleton argument. First of all, the difficulties in technology and the, the account this court should take of those. It's clear there were difficulties. Um, people were dropping in and out. There's one point, in fact, where I said... Um, and it's at, my lord doesn't need to look at it, but it's C272, when the appellant couldn't hear a question, I said, well, of course, she must be able to hear a question. We've got to make sure this is fair. Yeah. So I say those, those aren't, don't apply. In terms of speed and different treatment that the judge gave, it suggested to the appellant and the mother. Take your time, the, um, po the point about yeah, take your time. passage exactly. you were taken. Exactly. Yes. I say that that wasn't unreasonable and doesn't undermine the judge's approach, when one looks at what had previously happened in this case, and my Lord knows from the transcript that um, initially, and this goes back to my Lord's point as to where was everybody, when the mother started giving her evidence, she was in the courtroom with the judge and her counsel. Mother. Mother. At one point during my cross-examination, she asked for a break, went outside, that's right. And yes. then left the court yeah, building. Yeah. And then came back, carried on a bit longer. <laughs> then she said she felt unwell, and her counsel confirmed to the court that she was unwell. That's right. Because yes. she witnessed it. <laughs> then we went off. Uh, there were directions for medical evidence that never appeared. We listed it for directions mm. to try and get it back on track. And then once it did get on track, mother didn't appear for the first day. So there was a whole background to mother then re-engaging in the process and giving her evidence to her Honour Judge Nisa. 
And when she gave her evidence again, she was at home. The judge was still in court, but mother was at home. Um, she was clearly upset at points during her evidence. And the court can see, and I can perhaps provide references after lunch if, if my lord wants to see them, but where she, she clearly gets upset, she's, and the judge is trying to calm her down. So, and also she was on her own, at home giving evidence. She clearly had some difficulties. My lord knows um, the findings that are made are about her own drug use and her admitted drug use. Yes. She clearly had some vulnerabilities. And I say that the perceived different treatment must be seen in the context of the whole hearing. And I say it doesn't undermine but, but that doesn't, the judge's approach. That doesn't, does that help you on the appeal? Because what Miss Kelly is saying is that um, her client should have been afforded the same degree of consideration. It could be said that the, the mother's problems were more, or the difficulties she was having with giving evidence were more apparent for the reasons they were. you've identified, and that the, uh, whereas the appellants weren't apparent and weren't realised. That's this case. Well, the case. They, they certainly weren't realised for the reasons that my lord knows. But I say, in fact, when one looks at the transcript, and if my lord will allow me, I can take the court to a number of examples where it's clear. She, she understood fully what was happening, and clearly the, the crux of this appeal on the basis of the intermediary and the appellant's unknown vulnerabilities, the crux of what this court, in my respectful submission, has to decide is, was there unfairness? Mm. And I say there wasn't. Yeah. So albeit there, there had, if we turn the clock back and said, let's have an intermediary assessment, and there had been a recommendation for an intermediary, she probably would have had an intermediary. It's very unlikely I, on behalf of the local authority or anybody, would say, no, you're not having one. Well, there'd have been a ground rules hearing. There would have there been. There would have been a series of measures debated. There would have. You would have tailored your questioning in a different way. Potentially, but I say... Well, you'd have, you'd have tailored your questioning in the knowledge. In the knowledge, Which yeah. you didn't have before. Yes. And yeah, there might have been an interview. There probably would have been an interview. There probably would have with been. With and breaks. Yes. But I say that there, there were breaks at times. In fact, sometimes in false breaks, because of the delights of CVP that we, we then had. Yes. We did have some breaks. Um, and I say, for the reasons I'll come on to, it was there is no unfairness because it's clear from, her, from the appellant's evidence, I say, that she understood what she was being asked and she was able to give her evidence. Um, and also, and uh, my Lord knows well, what Lady Justice King said in Rien, that it's not a, an in, I'm paraphrasing, it's not, an, not inevitable. No, that it's, it all depends on the circumstances. Of course. And obviously in the circumstances in Rien, in fact it was Her Honour Judge Rayside, who identified that there were so problems, but carried on. <laughs> it's perhaps ironic that we're now talking about yes. Her Honour Judge Rayside in another context. So in that case, problems identified, but then carried on in a way that was found to be unsatisfactory. On the facts of that case, that particular um, appellant's IQ and the circumstances, very different to this case. And my Lord has only got two paragraphs. And the only reason that, on behalf of the local authority, I have seen the full report is not because I'm instructed in the continuation of the J proceedings, but because obviously it's the same local authority. But if my Lord wanted to see um, further parts of that report, then the appellant's instructions would have to be taken. Because as I understand from Ms Kelly, she's only agreed to those that one paragraph. And also Dr. Taylor's recommend, uh, answer saying he did not consider special measures were required um, was in direct response to a question that's been redacted, includes does she need an intervener? So that was the position as at due. He also, and because I didn't have a redacted copy, I only had the full copy, but I was careful in what I said in my skeleton argument, he specifically recommended that best practice should do, so that he went through, as my Lord will have seen, many, many of these reports, made some recommendations, but best practice. The appellant then goes to see Dr. Jostling, who says, may need an intermediary for important assessments, an intermediary or an advocate, in the, the, that sense of the advocate, as opposed to yes. a court advocate, for important meetings, assessments, and so on. So. I say it was quite different. Of course, then, we then get the community court assessment that we're told the difficulties and the recommendation of an intermediary. But I say it's, for those reasons and others, it's not on all fours with re or re -M. 
So what I say um, in respect of um, the process is I, I fundamentally I say it was fair. <coughs> My Lord may have seen both in the response statement that I, I prepared on behalf of the local authority back in August and my skeleton, I raised the point that my lady has specifically just raised, no, no appeal against eight and nine, no. which, which made no sense. And it made no sense in August, I say, and it's only um, just now that uh, that is suggested. But that is, is part of it. Um, but I do say... I think, the, on the, I think the, from, from, from my part, the question you've perhaps got to focus on is this. The judge clearly attached a lot of importance in her evaluation to the, to the impression that the appellant gave her in the, in the witness box. Yes. And her deflecting yes. uh, uh, answers. Does not, the, does not the fact that we weren't aware of her difficulties undermine that analysis? And given the importance that the judge attached to that, isn't that a strong argument in favour of allowing the appeal? That seems to me to be probably the main point against you. It, it's, it's an argument. I, I don't suggest it, it's a strong one for a number of reasons. And can I perhaps, my Lord, answer it by, by taking, my Lord, to, to certain examples in the appellant's evidence yeah. where I say she, she clearly could follow and, and understand. Um, so, my Lord, first of all, and I don't know whether my Lord just wants paper references or... Um, well, why don't you give... An example, and then give us the rest. Would this be all right? Give us the rest, of, and we'll have a look, perhaps over the short term. Of course. Would that be a good idea? Just give. Is that convenient? Yeah. So, have you got the page references to hand? I have got the page references to hand, but I just need the email that was sent by the new court. So, the summary that the court has from the new court is in that email that came last night. Yes. My Lord has it, I don't need to, to read it out. But in terms of processing <coughs> sentences, understanding terminology, understanding and responding, understanding complex vocabulary, simple, processing verbal information, and remembering key dates and often gets the details confused. So it's in that context I make these submissions about the transcript. So first of all, I say it's clear that the appellant knew exactly when her son had stayed previously in injuries he'd sustained. That's C197. Her son knew. She knew. She so. knew. She knew the dates when Jay had previously stayed with the parents, and I'm talking about obviously mother and father. So she her her, her recollection of the history, I say, was clear. Right. She gave a detailed account of what had happened in January. She clearly wasn't uh, confused about that. Um, one can see that from C197 to 199. She was able to express a clear view about what had happened and gave reasons for her beliefs. That's C201 to 202. She was given time to read passages. And my Lord may recall the point at the transcript that Miss Kelly took the court to where I asked, and I apologise because I hadn't checked, she was happy to read. And she said, yes, I am happy to read. And it might be worth actually looking at this particular passage of the evidence, my lord, so it's C203. And she was reading electronically, was she? Uh, my recollection is fairly good of this. I think she had a paper bundle and electronically, but she, she clearly, I suggest, and the transcript shows, she didn't have a problem navigating the papers. Um, I don't know whether Miss Kelly can help, but in any event, she had a full bundle in front of her. Miss Kelly? It's a, a paper bundle. There was a paper bundle. Okay. That's, that's well, bundles, presumably. Well, maybe it was only one bundle at that bundled. stage. I think it was bundles. Bundles, yes. Okay. Um, but in any event, perhaps I can go to see... 203? Uh, 203, yes, my lord. It's electronic 339. Oh. Yep. Where one can see where I said, and it's where I said, sorry, I should have asked you, are you happy reading it? And she said, I'm a bit slow. And then she said, I've read it. And then um, I said, what do you say has been twisted? And she said, I knew that, she said, I said all the way through I knew where Jay was. I knew what flat he was in. I couldn't remember the door number. I said all the way through, I've just kept writing it down. Now that part came immediately after the section that the appellant was being asked about. So she was able not only to read what she was being asked about, but she read on and then could put her point of view. And in fact, um, in the 
additional supplementary bundle, and this is at A2 of that bundle, Police log. Yes. About halfway down the page, my lord will see a redacted uh, older boy and then a redaction. So it's that part I'm looking at. She asked her friend to have Jay. <coughs> Does my lord have that? Yes. Um, and then, so she was being asked about that, and the appellant read on the section where it says after that. The friend lives along the road, does not know her surname or the house number where she lives, has not been in her flat. So I say that shows that the appellant was certainly following, because she wasn't actually being asked about that bit, but she read on and said, actually, I don't agree with that either. So I th say that's a clear example of her understanding and being able to follow the process. Similarly, um, the appellant clearly was able to ask questions if she doesn't, didn't understand and my lord already has the point at 207 that where she asked if an abrasion was in fact a bruise and I say um, adaptions were made because I, I then in fact used the word scratch which she clearly did understand. <coughs> the appellant was able to clearly express what she told Dr Wady, the doctor who'd carried out the child protection medical just about a year before. So that's C10. She managed to, to distinguish between usual events in Jay's life and unusual injuries at C214. She remembered where she'd read about certain incidents at C216. She was able to argue a case as to why there was no evidence she said she was under the influence at C227. She clearly understood the hair strand analysis because she talked about and clearly had knowledge about the time drugs could remain in a hair sample, that's 228. She, at one point when connection was lost and the counsel who had dropped out was then told what the question had been, the appellant then said what her answer had been. So again I say clearly following the proceedings and that was that C222. She used quite complex um, or sophisticated vocabulary herself. She used the word insinuate at C240 and C264. Let's have a look. 240. Whereabouts? My lord's ahead of me. Can I just have a moment? Top of page, for second answer. Okay. And then on 264, and I say that's clearly in context, and then at 264, same. Yes, you saw that with Miss Stone. You also said you lost your temper with him, did you not? That is why you grabbed him, and that's talking about another child, Jay's uh, another child. And then she says, not the sort of temper you're trying to insinuate. My Lord already has the reference, but for ease, it's C249, where she said, you're trying to confuse me and it's not working. She used the phrase on C252. Towards uh, sort of bottom third of the page, she says, um, when she's being asked about injuries, uh, and there... She was being asked, and in fact was asked in chief about injuries Jay had sustained, and clearly understood the word sustain, when she's asked, when you do not know what has happened, yes, I do not know how it happened, but Jay has a tendency to scratch himself. So again, I say that's uh, not unsophisticated language. And then the last reference I would take my Lord to is at C280, when the appellant said at the top of the page, I'm not having you put words into my mouth. So those are examples, I say, of um, evidence from the transcript and from the appellant herself that she did understand. And in addition, 
my lord, her statements filed in this case are extremely detailed. She'd clearly given um, very detailed instructions to her solicitor. She produced text messages, to, she produced photographs, and gave a very clear timeline of, of events in not just one, but two statements. So I say that, firstly, there's no unfairness demonstrated. Secondly, the judge was entitled to assess her evidence. I'm not minimising, of course, the importance of an intermediary, but, and I say that with that in mind, just because um, a litigant has an intermediary does not mean a judge cannot find they are not being truthful. And I say that the judge was entitled uh, to form those uh, well, the point is not that she the point did. is that the question is was the judge entitled to draw the conclusion she did bearing in mind that the appellant had unrecognized difficulties but, but I, I say she was entitled to because of her assessment as she was bound to make that assessment of her credibility as a whole taking into account the totality of her evidence and all of the evidence thank you and my lord in terms of um well, would that be a good place to stop, or are you making a final point? That's this? probably a good place to stop. Okay. Do you want us to look at anything over the short adjournment? You um, you've, you've raised through a number of references already. Perhaps that's what you were going to give us. I was going to give the court uh, a number of references in terms of deflection, where I say she was Which bundle are they in? To uh, poor bundle. Okay. Should we do that, or should we do it over lunch? Should we do it after lunch? Hmm? Okay. How... I think on reflection we'll deal with those at, at two o'clock in court. I don't think there's any danger of us not finishing, is there? I don't. No. Okay, we'll do that. I'm sure my lord will move me on when my lord's heard enough. Okay. Right. Now just a moment. Two o'clock.